music's the ultimate. Oh, there it's coming on. So if you're in the kitchen, or if you're upstairs, or if you're out in the garden, it's, the, it's almost like a signal that you have to run to the TV. Do you mind what this place used to be like when they built it at first? Oh. Craig Lang, developing for the future. Aye, aye. Craig Lang, modernity beckons. Craig Lang, tomorrow's already here. Craig Lang. Shite hole. <laughs> I'm sure it's a lots of my English chums and, and people from all over Britain, and they absolutely get it. So although the fact that it, you tend to think of it as, as utterly Glaswegian, there's one or two things they miss, wee references and stuff, but it's, uh, it travels incredibly well. It's just hilarious, and that's the beginning and the end of it. What I love about Still Game is it's, it's not just about Glasgow, it's not just about Scotland, actually. It could be anywhere. Victor and Jack could live in Vladivostok. I bet you there are Victor and Jackson Vladivostok or Idaho or somewhere. What do you make of this weather, Eric? And the ground's all slippy, I know. I nearly went my arse there. Oh, it's a pair of these you're wanting. Permagrip soles, Timpsons, 1999. Is that right? Ah, uh, you've got to take care of yourself at her age, you know. <laughs> Come here. Here, hold on. Jesus, he's all right. Watch your feet, Jack. It's slippy. <laughs> it's a pair of these you're wanting. Permagrip, 1999. Got them out of oh. <laughs> oh! That boy at Timpson's getting kicked squarely in the nuts. <laughs> Former Q. The thing that strikes me about uh, Ford and Greg is that they are in that mould of the classic, classic double act, like Laurel and Hardy. Uh, like Morecambe and Wise, like the two Ronnies. F somehow, sometimes, very rarely, I think, fate brings two people together for a reason. And those two happen to meet up and happen to create a third person, if you like, a third thing. And it's this amazing explosion of talent, the fact that they write, the fact that they perform, and basically the fact that they're very, very funny together. They're great as individuals, but together, there's something special happens. Jesus. God. Jesus. It's all cloudy. Can't even see the ball. I first became aware of Still Game uh, when uh, my my household had a very uh, worn out uh, VHS copy of the original stage play. Uh, Showing my age a bit there. It was I a cat saved a woman's life. Something about the gas being left on and the cat fetched the polis. <laughs> <laughs> It was just something I could sit down and watch with my dad, you know, and uh, there's obviously a golf and generations and stuff, and sometimes you've not got tons to talk about, but you stick on still game and he'd have a beer and I'd have a cup of tea and we'd just sit and laugh away. Aye. Here now, oh. you want a wee cup of tea there, Jack, eh? Well, a wee cup aye. of tea would be lovely, eh? Nice wee orange club with it. Oh, aye. a wee orange wee club, bit of chocolate. <laughs> oh, aye. A wee penguin, oh, eh? Oh, a wee penguin, eh? Aye. aye, well, tough titty. <laughs> it's rich tea or hee-haw. <laughs> Well, we'd done uh, the show at the Edinburgh Festival, and Karen Corn, who was good enough to give us a venue to do it in, uh, at the end of the run said to us, I can get you to Canada on the back of this. They've got a festival there, and they're willing to take your show for three weeks, was it? Three weeks? Mm -hmm. So we get there. <clears throat> now, the set only involved a stinking old carpet, a hoover, a horrible old three-piece suite, and a sideboard. That was it, and a, a box for a television. So we thought we can get most of that over there. We'll be able to pick that up for a props department over there. However, what we'll not be able to get is a hoover, which was a pivotal moment in, uh, in the show, like the one we had in the show. What are you doing with that? Well, it's all right, it's got wheels on it. There you are. Right, get that plugged in there. Right. 
You have to remember we were always winding each other up here. We said to Paul, um, you'll need to bring a Hoover uh, and take it to Canada. And he's went, nah, an old Hoover, an old Hoover Junior, all the way to Canada. They don't have Hoovers over there like that. No, they don't have Hoovers like that. We said, you know, you'll, you'll never be able to get them. They, they Hoover different over there. They, they different. So can you bring yours? <laughs> so, he's, uh, right up to the last minute, we had no idea he was going to show up with Hoover. We're standing at the airport waiting for him right there, he turns up. Well, you know, you know the way when you lift him, all the stairs comes out of the back. He's up in the line. <laughs> and, uh, to oh, check in. Oh, just to check it in, and they wanted to know what it was and where it was going and all that. You know, he was, his life was a misery. But it wasn't until we landed, we actually got there, they realised we didn't need the Hoover. The, ca the Canadians don't have Hoover Juniors, they don't have them. So you're going out there, right? Mm. And there they are, the wee bastards, right? And they say, right, give your pension book, right? Well, you just give them a wee nip of this. <laughs> on your way! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, I've not just shot him myself. Let me see the thing. No, hold on a minute. Jack, go and just. Oh, Jesus Christ, Victor, what have I done to you? Oh, 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 oh no, I've killed him, oh Jesus. Get out of me! Get out of me, you bloody clown, what are you doing? Oh, you've come back, thank Christ. I thought I'd killed you. Jesus, Jack, what happened to me? Oh, this bloody thing. I didn't realise the voltage was so high. It's all right, it's all right. You oh. wanted to know. Help oh. us up here. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, then. Oh. 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 That's a bloody lethal weapon, now. Are you all right? I am fine, I'm fine. There's no hurting done. Ah, well. Give that to me, because I'm going to put it in the bin. All right. There you are. <laughs> It's like when you watch an early episode of The Simpsons and the characters don't quite look like they do now, you know, and the voices are slightly different, mine in particular. Um, <laughs> but uh, there were characters that we always came back to. We always felt very safe doing those characters, you know. They were like a boy in the ocean. You just, like, you went to them because uh, they were easy to, to write. I mean, I think, I think when we look back at during the fact now, I mean, when you see how much of Jack and Victor are in the entire... Uh, was it four episodes? So four runs? Four runs, yeah. Um, there's about... I think there's about an hour's worth of stuff for Jack and Victor in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, we felt that the best place to always put them is in the pub, and we used to write songs for them that were sort of reminiscent of songs that you would have heard your grandparents singing, sort of pub songs, and that's how they became. Then, uh, uh, popular by us and the fans, but the, <clears throat> we, then we brought in Tam, character to because we wanted to sound like a barber shop harmony i never managed it once <laughs> but uh, and then we put uh, paul into it as well if you're going to break a heart oh. be sure to break oh. a fat girl's heart they're bigger <laughs> much bigger <laughs> if you're going to ruin someone's life be sure they're not a scale <laughs> Skinny girls are fine, but when you dump them, they just run and find another. But when you crush a chubby's heart, she remains with all the fatties on the shelf. That shelf is creaky. She remains with all the fatties on the shelf. <laughs> So it was just a natural step that when we got the chance to do a, a sitcom that it was the old guys that we took. What delights do you have on offer from your varied and extensive menu? Pies. Oh, pies. Do you hear that, Jack? They have pies. Oh, that's dandy because I was getting sick of that lobster thermidor, you know. When was the last time we had pies, Jack? Oh, yesterday. Oh, well, pies it is then. Two pies as they come. Yes, as per usual. Frozen in the middle and red hot round the outside. Irresistible. Mm. Tam, uh, could you go a pie? Aye, a pie, aye. Aye. We'll come back tomorrow and get it out of there. <laughs> There's a joke, actually. There's a joke that sums up actors perfectly. And it's how many actors does it take to change a light bulb? Two. One to change the bulb and the other one to say, I could have done that. And that's, but we, we forwarded Greg. That's one of the few things that I've never thought. Because I watch them and I go, actually, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't be as good as that. And I don't know anybody else that could be as good as that. I think the performances are exceptional. So you two are brothers? Hey, oh, yeah, brothers, I. Yes, of course, uh, Jack's a couple of years older than me. <laughs> <laughs> don't start with your lies, Victor. He's actually two years older than I am. So are you retired, the both of you? Oh, yes, yes. We sold our business. Oh, what sort of business did you have? 
a beetroot. Jan, sending it all over the world. You'd be surprised how lucrative it is. And of course we sold the business, then we split it right down the middle, you know. I'm good to myself, I don't mind telling you that, and I have been. Yeah. I was a little bit shrewder with my money. I uh, invested it and tripled it in a year. Mm -hmm. a very clever man, my older brother. And sadly, my wife died, but she was independently wealthy, you see. So that brought me right back up on a par financially with Victor again. <laughs> then, unfortunately, my wife died. And she left me enough to race away back in front of you, <laughs> Jack. I think what's great as well is there's a real community spirit. Something perhaps that a lot of communities maybe don't have anymore. Um, it's that thing of everybody looking out for one another. And I think that's what makes it so incredibly real. I mean, all of these characters, and it doesn't matter if it's a character who's got a walk-on part and says one line, they're all absolutely true. It gives me great pleasure to be here today. Oh, it does, Nate. <laughs> to, uh, you know, with great admiration, I've watched the community of Craig Lang grow and flourish. Oh, no, you have, Nate. <laughs> My father grew up here in Craig Lang, and he always had the greatest respect for his home. No, I did, Nate. And I only wish that he could be here today to see this. No, you don't. I'm sure that he would join me in congratulating Craig Lang today as we open this wonderful facility. For this building is a magnificent addition to a caring, thriving, forward-thinking community. No, it is not. <laughs> you know, the other characters, you know, were written for people that we ostensibly don't like it as well. You know, Bobby's a bad man and we're always at loggerheads with him, but he's your Bobby and you don't mess with him. Do you know what I mean? If somebody comes in and gives him a hard time. He might be a wanker, but he's your wanker. Yeah, he's your Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> that wanker's your Bobby. <laughs> oh, this bastard, when it's done, you can't get it up. When it's up, you can't get it done. I'd have thought you were a bit young for the old Viagra, Bobby. <laughs> Shut up. Right, Bobby, out the road. What the hang's lethal? He's got a wife, he's in. <laughs> Hello. I was kind of mucking about on YouTube and I actually typed in the, uh, the still game thing and it had a compilation of all these entrances that, um, that Ford and Greg would make to the pub and have a, um, Bobby the barman would have a, a, a pop at them, and every single time, and it was a compilation, every single time they'd, um, he, they would come in and sort of be like, oh, oh, here they are, you know, sort of mark them wise, and boom, 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 they'd put them down. Here they are again, you know, sort of, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, boom, boom, boom. And uh, it was very, very funny. I mean, it, and it kind of, sort of just reminded you as to why it is so hugely popular. Oh, here they come, Abbott and Costello. You're putting the beef on, Jack. Uh, that's right. Every time I shag your wife, she makes me a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look who it is. Phyllis and Diller. That's going to be the worst yet, you toss pot. Because <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis Diller's one person, no two. <laughs> Normally, when we come in, Bobby, you get, look, it's Batman and Robin, or Laurel and Hardy, you know, double acts. What you said there's like saying, look, it's Frank and Sinatra. Aye, or Bob and Hope, but that's your partner. <laughs> Aye, knock your cell out, son, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Jack, it's Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. <laughs> this, this is kind of slightly prickly area. Uh, their relationship is like a marriage. I think the thing about Jack and Victor is it, it is a platonic love affair, <laughs> you know? Mm. And, uh, yeah, it is, it is. It's very, very modern. Well, very modern family. Uh, but they do love each other and, and they look out for each other and when... when you when, see how comfortable he is talking about it when he hear him's like that? With the body language here. <laughs> oh yes, it's a platonic love affair. <laughs> <laughs> it's about friendship, real deep friendships. And although, you know, although they're both very Scottish and that's why I love it so much, um, they're never going to tell each other that they love each other. But they really do. They really do. They do anything for one another, despite all the banter and the nonsense. You've done it again. Un mm -hmm. un no, arms. I'm not doing that. Oh, the man, I, my arms are perfectly natural right, okay, here. Fair enough. Oh, Isa. Marlon Jack. What is it? Is that Victor? What's Victor doing in your house at seven o'clock in the morning? Uh, he came across for butter, a line of butter. Where 
Where's this ice cream, Jack? Certainly, sir. Of course it can be. Here, but it's your turn to mop the land, and, and I was just wondering if you wanted me to do it. Aye, that would be smashed. That would be very good of you, Isa. Mop the land, and... <laughs> Is that it? Aye, that's it. Thank you, mate. <laughs> Who's that? Isa. Who else would have... <laughs> Listen, take a look at this, Jack. It's getting bigger. Is it ready? Pop. Oof. That's like crack a tour, that. Can't go away in a minute. Ooh, it's a cracker right enough. It's an absolute belter. Yes, please. But it's important to get it across, you know, that they're real people with depth and they struggle and they, you know, they, they, they you know, they pine when the other one's away and, and because people do. And, and uh, that may have accidentally became <clears throat> what part of the heart of the show is. It might be. I don't, we, we can't pinpoint exactly what it is. People like it for different reasons. But lots of people have said to us that yeah. they like the, the sad bits as well. Yeah, the show's about companionship. So whenever that is threatened in the show, when that companionship is threatened, it, it, it hurts the characters. They can be funny, sad. They can, they can make you, really make you laugh one minute and make you cry the next. That is the really, really brilliant writing and brilliant acting. It's just, you know, tugs at your heartstrings. It's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, that, eh? was a rare day, that, eh? Yeah. How long's Gina away now, Jack? Hmm, about two weeks, it'll be. Ten year. Ten year? That means my Betty's away twelve year. Uh, it's all racing away for us now, eh? Uh, that's uh, kind of a bother, but I'm not, I'm not going through all that again. You know, Jack, it's, it's not my place to to tell you how long a man should mourn, but... Ten years... Ten years is plenty. Uh, Going on a date doesn't he betray Jean's memory. She'd want you to be happy. Why don't you get doing that shop? Ask that woman out, eh? Besides... Hey, daddies. <laughs> My first appearance in Still Game was as Edith, and I was a blind date to Victor. Jack had asked Barbara, who played by the lovely Eileen McCallum, she played Barbara, and I played her sister, Edith. Now, they didn't know what I looked like. I remember we were filming, we came in the bus, and Jack and Victor were waiting at the bus stop. Hello, Jack. Hello, Victor. This is my sister. He did. Hello, lads. Hi, Winston. Oh, hello, ladies. I'm Winston. Oh, hello, Winston. <laughs> you still born? Hi. Which one of you two unlucky bastards is saddled with a munchkin? Right, that's it. Where are you going? Hey, I'm not sitting in my local with that thing, Jack. Oh, well, that's just perfect, isn't it? You're going eh, while they're me with these two women. I only saw one woman, Jack. I don't know what that other one is. A munchkin, sure. Shut up! Once you've established all these characters as fully blown characters, then when you start to embark on writing a new show, you say, well, let's say, for instance, somebody showed up with a big red nose. You, you, you're, you're writing immediately because you've got, you know exactly how these characters are going to react to that. Isa would be away telling everybody, oh, there's a man where you want to see this man's nose, honest to God. And, and uh, Winston and Tam would, could not avoid talking about it or pointing at it. Uh, Bobby would probably drop a, a bottle when he's seen it for the very first time. You, you can, you're off in one because you know how the, the community would react to this thing happening. Victor, Jack, what are you staying in at this time? Well, we're out with a couple of friends if it was any of your bloody business. <laughs> and by the way, while I'm at it, when are you letting Winston back in? When he apologises. Hmm. Aren't you uh, going to introduce me? No, certainly. Barbara. Hello. Hello, Barbara. And Edith. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey, who is her? Uh, well, we'll have our usual, uh, have we? Gin and tonic, please. Here it is. Fine again, it's... Oh, yeah. I don't know. 
So after the date, they go away and they go to the bus stop to go home. And Barbara, Eileen McCallum, she kisses Jack and then my character Edith goes to kiss Greg. See you soon then, Jack. Oh. <laughs> That's what everybody mentions, actually. That's how clever they are. They say, they oh, I love that bit when he grabs your head and he goes like that, or then shoves you on the bus. It's brilliant. So I just remember that. That was just so funny, really funny. The one scene I was ever in, still game, was I was playing a character called Martin, and it's a 30-second, 40-second scene, and his mother has bought Empire Biscuits instead of Snowballs, and he loses the rag. I'm not wanting an Empire Biscuit, I'm wanting a Snowball. Nay no snowballs? Yeah. You stupid... Oh, cow! Relax, Martin, you've got an empire biscuit. I'm no you. one an empire biscuit! I want a snowball! Taxi! <laughs> Maybe if you have a job, eh, Martin, you're mocking right your ass for you, Martin. <laughs> And I get that shouted at me at least once a week, to this day, by people. And I can never remember what they're talking about. It takes me to be surprised every single time. But if you've, if you've sneezed in still game, it stays with you for the rest of eternity. And I'm very proud of it. It's great. When I came up to Scotland, it would be fair to say, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, that of the people who come up to see it, hey, big man, I saw you in... It's nine... M more than nine out of ten... Ten times, it's Stewie Maduri. Well, I'm just under six foot six, and I think I had heels on, which were maybe four or five inches, so I must have been six foot ten, and then I had a hat on top of that, so I must have been somewhere near seven feet. I felt huge. <laughs> Smashing your hearing. in this. Me boiler, Victor. A couple of things. People remember the, the throwing the thing out the window, going at the nets. They remember the drink. And they also remember, and thank you for this, boys, they remember the 18-inch pile of shite in the toilet. So it would be fair to say, yes, it's followed me around, in some senses, like a bad smell. I'm doing Isa. Look. Look. What was supposed to be Luke? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that big innocent, isn't it? Dirty big bastard. He must have had to have stood up to get his cell off of that. What am I going to do? I can't have that. Bar it with a new brush. Break any bits. Oh, half pick of Domestis. Burn it to death. Domestis. One of the main things I love about it is <clears throat> the fact that lines are crossed. Uh, very often, and I love that, I love it. Because what is also obvious and evident is that underneath that kind of broad, very broad, over-the-line humour, they're decent people. I mean, a lot of the characters we've got are based on people. Mine's is my Uncle Barney, Greg's is his grandfather, Sammy. Um, Tam is based on uh, a friend of mine, uh, Martin. Uh, I'll say his surname, Kane, who's very miserable. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so we, we're just drawing for people that we know and, you know, planting it on the other people. <laughs> 300, not a halfpenny less. Right, Tam, you heard the man. 300 quid. Yeah. I've got him out of a barrel here. I'm the only bidder. I'll say 150. You hell, you miserable bastard. You listen to me. This is your chance to do the right thing. Be generous. The car's worth 300. You've got that in your pocket. Now give Victor his money. <laughs> 300. Thanking you. I think as characters go, they do have their traits and they can be exaggerated as they would be in any sort of drama. But the characters themselves are funny and they're sad 
at times because they're real. I think that's the, that's the, that's the fact. People watch it and it is very real life. People can see the characters in people. They're, they're not outrageous. Uh, they're not unbelievable characters. And I think that's what's gave it the longevity. Willie, Christ, look at the state you're in. Are you riding a bike, Willie? Hi. It's a gift from my girlfriend. Aye, aye, we saw the pair of you doing at the cafe, aye, aye. Chris, she's half your age, man. Are you no a bit old for a bike, Willie? Nonsense. She got me a bike, keep me fit. Keep you fit for what? Oh, you're not actually. <laughs> Are you? Absolutely not your business. What a thing to ask. I would never discuss anything personal like that. Any condoms, Navi? <laughs> Oh, nothing, nothing. Sorry, Willie. Ask again. I won't laugh. Condoms. I'm needing condoms. <clears throat> Ribbed or flavoured? <laughs> Flavour. <laughs> oh, get it up, yes! I've got your boots. But Naveed's such a great character, because the corner shop is such a part of people's lives now, you know. He's such a great character, because he, he is obviously Asian, and he's still got that thing at the back of his, you know, that accent, but also the glasses of Egypt. And I, funny enough, I used to uh, live in um, Edinburgh, and there was a guy exactly like that. And I go, what about the bloody hibs? What the hell did they think they were doing on Saturday? You know, that accent, you know. There was a guy that I went to college where they used to talk that all the time. It used to crack me up. Um, so I knew that that accent was there for the taking, and, you know, don't worry, I've signed the paperwork, it's all above board and legal, I spoke to the provost about it. <laughs> ah, Jack, Victor. Morning, David. Aye, aye, aye. Do you want to say that, Tom? Heard about the big card game. Sounds gallus. Well, you're welcome to join us. Poker, eh? Ah. The green bays, whether to raise, whether to call. Oh, the tension. The splashing sound the chips make as they are thrown into the ever-growing pot. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Who do you play next? I'll stay night if you fancy it. I'll be there with bells on. Then you know that Muslim man doesn't play. Oh, that's right. Muslims don't gamble. No gambling, no drinking. What a riot. No, no. We just like to sit with the house playing cut plunk. Mina is an incredibly popular uh, character in Still Game, and, and for very good reason. Um, I just think the writing there is just absolute genius. They have this lovely, spiky, sarky relationship, at the heart of which is a nugget of pure love, but, you know, you have to, a few layers to get through to get to it, but it's there. And there's clearly... She's running the show. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. She's in the back shop pulling the strings. The essence of, of comedy, of course, as we all know, is things going wrong. Um, just like the essence of drama is conflict. I mean, you cannot make a good drama about a, a happily married couple with three lovely children living in Surrey. That's, that ain't a drama. And almost all really good comedy is about well, A, things going wrong, but also uh, dysfunctional families. And it occurred to me watching Still Game the other day that, that uh, Craig Lang is essentially a hilariously dysfunctional community. Oh, oh Jesus, we'll, we'll be on oh. the phone and our girls. Oh. Miss Lassie's having a wee. Oh. All right. I don't think I'm going to be able to wait. It's coming. Oh. Oh. Is there a doctor in here? Jack and Victor have just passed their first steeds of delicate. Let them through. Come on, it's so cute. Oh, oh. Right, then. Oh. Is that uh, the heat? Oh. Oh, you're so high. Oh. The writing is very clever and one of the biggest laughs that we had, because we, you know, as the cast, we would go to the, uh, the audience screenings where they would record the laughter track. And I know for a fact that they've had to, it's one of the few occasions where they've had to actually reduce the laughter and actually have it dip under because there was too much laughter. And one of the biggest sort of roller coaster laughs I experienced was, it was the episode where Winston wins the, was it the 30 or the 40 grand um, from Stevie the Bookie? That's 33 grand! <laughs> 
500 quid. <laughs> Thank you, Stevie. Thank you for keeping my money warm. Now get into that safe and get me paid. Look at you, Stevie. You're actually thinking about doing it again, aren't you? Dana Runner. What are you going to do this time? Cut your balls off and come back as your sister? <laughs> get me paid. <laughs> Thank you, Stevie. The thing about sitcom is, is that you have to get back to the place you were at the beginning. So you're, you're, at, the, you're at the start point, and whatever happens, happens. You know, the A story, the B story takes you somewhere, but you have to get back. I mean, that's the whole point is, in a sitcom, you're sort of trapped, and you need to get back to being trapped so you can carry that on. So you've got, what, maybe a minute to go left of this episode of Still Game, Winston's 30 grand richer. And you're thinking, well, what's going to happen now? He's 30 grand richer, has everything changed? You're not going to do anything still with that money now, are you? No, no, no danger. Oh, oh, but his face, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was as if I'd planted one right in his balls. <laughs> <laughs> Boof! Right in the Niagara Falls. <laughs> Boof! Right in the Costa del Souls. <laughs> right in the Vina McCall's. <laughs> Boof! <laughs> But in the space of a minute, he's lost his leg and he's lost the 30 grand. That's a beautiful example as well as the A story being the, the money, the B story being Winston's legs, just tying in a big, fat, lovely knot. I'm speaking for 40 as well, but the two of us have our favourite sitcoms and our preference for sitcoms tend to be ensemble pieces, things like, like Cheers or mm -hmm. something like Seinfeld, where the guy in the middle is like the satellite and all, everything else moves around about him, you know? Um, shows like that, uh, they... they they just grow out organically for the audience as well, I think, you know. And everybody has a favourite character, uh, as do we. Um, and that's kind of a fun show to write. It's a much more fun show to write than a show that the audience is only interested in one or two characters. And if, if you do a subplot with another character, they're, they're not so keen on it because they're not invested in it. But the audience is invested in Bobby and Isa and yeah. Winston, and, and we, can, we can give them the ball to run with it, and, and, and run with it they do. My pal's come to get me. <laughs> Where the hell have you been? Get in the car, Jack. I'm not in any mood to piss about. Right, we have to get in! <laughs> Wait a bloody minute. We've all got the same place, driver. Hey, Victor. <laughs> What the bloody hell's that smell, oh. eh? Oh, fish dumper. Oh, dear, he's a... Mm. Don't open that in this car. Yeah, it's over here, take a chip. Yeah. Bless you, smoke. Oh, yeah. No, oh. he's a bloody 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 and everybody's got different favourite characters. Some people will say, oh, I love Isa, I should just let my next door neighbour, or I love Naveed, or I love Tam, whoever. And I think the boys have been generous in that they, they don't always write themselves the best lines. Sometimes some of my favourite lines are other people's. And it's, you know, a lot of writers wouldn't do that. They would keep all the best lines for themselves. It wasn't really always about generosity, though, because Ford and I had a lot of hangovers during those shows, and it was always good to get the other cast members to take the bulk of the weight of the episode and carry us. Uh, and I remember one time, um, <laughs> there was an episode that was 27 minutes long and Colin Gilbert came to us and went, you need two minutes. And we were like, well, I'm not writing a new piece to learn for two minutes. And we got Jane McCarry and we wrote her a monologue in the lift. And it's that right. scene from the lift where she guesses where Jack and Victor are going to go just by the way they're dressed and we don't say a word. Right. And we gave, it to, we gave it to Jane half an hour before we filmed it. Went, That's going in love in about uh, half an hour. So if you could learn that, she went, fine. And she learned it and did it in one take. One take. <laughs> That's, that's what she's like. Oh, look at you, Stu. Oh, done up smart. Nice jackets. Betty's gone. Oh, we're not going to the clansmen. No turned out like that. Must be somewhere good, eh? Somewhere special. 
Eh, what would that be? What would the reason be? A wedding? No, it's not a wedding. You'd have buttonholes on for a wedding. It's not a funeral because of the tie. And it's not a court case. I'd have heard about that one. <laughs> it's a day out somewhere. Somewhere that isn't a Craig Lang. It's a tune. It's a tune, isn't it? <laughs> I know where you're going. But why? Are you celebrating something? Your birthday? No. Two old pals going into the tune. Two old pals celebrating. Celebrating me. Celebrating just been old pals. That's it, isn't it? What an anniversary. Ooh, that's it, isn't it? She's creepy with that. Ah, she gives me the fear. She is a joy to play. First of all, because you're always comfortable. You know where you are with Isa. You've got polyester, layers of cheap wool and a comfortable shoe. So you, Isa, where are you off to? Navid's. My way today, my shift. That was close. We got off lately there. Tinson, I'm glad I caught you there. I completely forgot to tell you. Tell me what, Isa? Well, I never buy the times. There's usually nothing in it you haven't read in the real papers. Just the same old news again later on. Rubbish, really. And there's no point buying twice for it. Anyhow, don't ask me why, but I bought one. And I was fucking great. and thought something like to do. What are you doing, Winston? I'm trying to fast forward you to the punchline. <laughs> Get to the end of the story. I will. I was flicking through it. The end. At the intimation set. The end, mind. Wally McIntosh is dead. Thank you. A lot of times they do horrible things to Isa or they'll say horrible things. They always have her back. You know, they, they, they decorated her flat for her. They, you know, when Harry, which she was trying to get rid of Harry, Winston, who doesn't have a great deal of time for Isa, still came and looked after Isa, pretended to be to go to bed with her and everything, which is one of my favourite scenes. Because <laughs> when we were filming it, we had to do about 20 takes because we kept laughing and he fell out the bed and hit his head. <laughs> Isa, sweetheart. <laughs> the set's terrific fun to work on. It's hard work, but it, it's great fun because everyone knows each other so well. I think the cast are a joy to work with. They all know their characters inside out, therefore they can relax and not be nervous about the work they're doing, which means they can have fun doing that work. What have you been on recently, Paul? Uh, Coxie and I have just finished a detective series set in Holland called Clever Clogs. <laughs> <laughs> When we were uh, filming Tiger, a lot of the same crew would uh, finish Tiger and go and work on Still Game. They seemed to fit in together. And they would all go off and they would come back to, to start filming again in Tiger. And they would come back with all these amazing stories about what a laugh they had on the set of Still Game. There were so many carry-ons, wind-ups. They even had quizzes at lunchtime. Whereas on the set of Tiger, all I had was Alex Norton uh, snoring in the corner of the trailer. Uh, so yeah, I was always really jealous that Still Game just sounded like this brilliant uh, job to work on and sounded like such a laugh. Whereas all we did was pull dead bodies out of bin bags in the Garski Road. Oh! Oh, Jesus. Back the boat. <laughs> no, 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 this way! In the boat, you diddy! Oh, Christ! Oh, my God! <laughs> News are deed. They will look deed. That was our picnic, your dicks. Keys were beer. We drank it all, and it was delicious. Stop that, dude. You're just annoying him. Do you know what we've got to do, use? No. See if you have it. I'll try and play it. <laughs> well, subtlety didn't really come into it with uh, Still Game. I, I got a phone call from my agent saying that um, the director of uh, Still Game would like to meet me, and uh, I went along to see Michael Hines, and he gently explained that the character was uh, one who had um, 
almost superhuman hearing. Uh, uh, hearing, of course, ears. Here, Victor, don't be annoying him. As old as he is, he's still bloody handy, and he is doing us a favour. Look, let's just not be hanging about sitting there while he rattles on about the war. Shut up, he'll hear you. Oh, I can hear through bloody walls and all now. Aye, I can. <laughs> Jack, Victor, what can I do for you? <laughs> but when I was about 17, a uh, casting director in London said to me, oh, my dear boy, you will get nowhere in this business if you don't have your ears pinned back. Fortunately, I didn't pay any attention to that because if I had, I would never have been in still game. Never been shug the lug. So, of course, I turn up at makeup and wardrobe uh, on the first day. The, the, the wardrobe is not very complicated. Makeup, I thought, well, I'm, I'm one of the oldest people in the show. Most of the other guys are ageing up. I'm playing my own age. So they maybe just have to put a few wee lines on me. Or anything. And then suddenly Julie Dorrit Keenan comes out with a huge pair of rubber ears. <laughs> Ignominy. As if they're not big enough, they're going to put rubber ears on as well. Oh, dear me. But there's a box in makeup at the comedy unit that just says Shug's Lugs. I think that's rather nice. Shuggy! Whoa, whoa, what you doing? What you doing? You're going to come over and blow the tits off us about Tim Rook. Uh, right enough, aye. Uh, trick. <laughs> Who do you suppose is in the bag? Ach, the eye buys that shitey breed, you know. Snappy shopper. <laughs> 22 <laughs> pence a loaf. That's because he's a miserable old bastard, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my favourite episode, or, or to be better, my favourite moment of Still Game is uh, uh, Winston's accumulator. Uh, you know, and he's having the thing with Steve the Bookie, and it's constantly going on and coming in, and he's winding up. And it's just the moment uh, when he comes in the bookies, and it's just coming up. Steve's just putting the pens in the wee holes as Winston's just building to erupt and erupt and erupt. And it's just the comic timing, and it's beautifully done. And then Bang! As the last one goes in, you can't hear him. You just see him mouthing all his explosive shouting, "You effing us, effing at him!" It's, you hate it when I win and you love it when I lose. That's right. Money flows into your till all day, Stevie, but that's not enough, is it? With my money, you have to gloat. <laughs> A gloating bookie. I mean, that's unheard of in the bookie world. You must be the worst bookie in Britain. <laughs> you lie, Stevie boy. One day I'm gonna win. And I'm going to win big, and then you'll be gutted. In fact, you'll be beyond gutted. And then I'll be the one who's gloating. And boy, can I gloat, Stevie boy. You want to see me when I start gloating? You clock, you clock, you dunder, you and this bookie's on the water. It's, it's a standout moment for me. The thing we haven't mentioned is how beautifully written it is. And how two guys in... who, I think when they started, they must have been in their early 30s, when they were in their late 20s. And I actually, um, they, they quite sweetly asked me to write the intro to the book. And uh, I said, how can two guys that age uh, write so beautifully about a couple of grave dodgers? <laughs> as, as they would call them, <laughs> grave dodgers. How do they do that? I and mean, I can't think of anyone else who's done it. Feeble. We're getting feeble. That's a word for it. First the body goes, then the mind. I mean, imagine not being able to catch a rolling flask, for God's sake. Ah, <laughs> oh, didn't you beat yourself up, Jack? It's no your fault. I'm the dafty that's shoved off the shelf. <laughs> I mean, take yesterday, for instance, lads, you know. Twenty minutes it took me to open a can of bloody peas. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I've ended up making a tiny wee hole and getting them out pee by pee. <laughs> that's <laughs> you all. Where do you see this? The man should just spring back, but I've timed it. Fifteen full minutes for that to reset it. Put your finger in there. Indeed I will not put my finger in your bloody leg. It's such a brave thing to do. And you can imagine the pitch. Imagine, ima imagine right, you're, you're, the, you're the guy who, who puts stuff on, on BBC telly. You've got a great idea, right? A couple of 32-year-old guys are going to dress up and behave like a couple of guys in their mid-70s. It'll be hilarious. You'll be going... Uh-huh. <laughs> the good thing about the fact that it's young people playing old people is that there's a big, long lifespan to the show. So if you look at Dad's Army, where most of the cast probably started out in the late 60s, 
you probably get five, six good years before people get too old. Ford and Greg started this when I think they were probably late thirties, early forties. They could make this for forty years and still look the same, and they just use less makeup each year. Oh. Oh. It says no ball games. Can you not read? Shut up, yo. The other thing which is terribly funny about it is it's not remotely um, age specific. My children, who are 16 and 21, quite often, if there's nothing on the telly, will just throw in a still game and we'll all sit down and watch it as a family and laugh till our sides hurt, despite the fact we've all seen it about 17 <laughs> times. You know, there's not many shows you can say that about. It's amazing that it's, it's rolled over and rolled over for generation to generation. People talk about, somebody said to me, their dad handed them down his DVDs <laughs> as, if, <laughs> as if it was... You needed it to survive. Listen. See, once we uh, shut this place up... Aye. You don't... fancy going for a curry, do you? Aye. I love curry. Good. Good. I better go and get set up then. Hi. Off you go. Table for one at the Indian Star tonight, Bobby. <laughs> My bit of advice that I'd always say to MD though, uh, whenever they find one of these uh, still game repeats, or, fingers crossed, if you go and watch a new series, is uh, if you're recording it, always record the programme after it as well. Right? Now, I don't care if it's Miranda or Citizen Can or something like that. You don't need to watch it, but always record the programme after it because the amount of times I've been sat there Episode is nearly finished, and up come the credits at the end. And you think to yourself, still got that wee magic bit to go at the end, the very, very end. Can he wait now? It's nearly there. Boom. End of recording, right up across the screen. It is the most annoying thing in the world. And you think, what was that last wee bit going to be? Because it's always a gem, you know. What a heat I've got. Bloody hell. Is I thinking about slapping Margot's arse? You stupid bastard, Bobby. Still, the place was mobbed. It was a cracking night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dorothy Paul was in Still Game. She played uh, Francis, my wife's sister, and uh, she was she, she was interested in me in that way, you know, and uh, I, 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 I too was very interested in her, very attractive, very attractive woman, Dorothy Paul. When I was offered this part, I was absolutely thrilled. Imagine being offered the part of the romantic interest, me, eh? <laughs> and especially working with uh, Tam, because, I mean, Tam's a youngster, but it, he plays the part so well, you just feel you're with somebody of your own age. Uh, it was it was exciting. It was exciting for an old man. <laughs> I'll just get you a tea for the bus, Molly. Oh, well, I'll come with you then. Don't be stupid, you've got the case. You stay and keep Molly company. All right, so. What's the matter, Tam? Do you not want to be alone with me? That's a problem, see? I want to be alone with you. Tonight, my morning, night, for the rest of my life. Your tight fistedness drives me crazy, sweetheart. <laughs> Gets me harder than the crossword in the herald. <laughs> but this wedding band says we can never be. I'm married to your sister, Molly. Any feelings I have for you ain't worth the hell of beans. <gasps> Got your tin of sweeties and all, Molly. Oh, thanks. Now, you look after yourself. <gasps> Here's one last freebie for you, Tam. I loved an episode that was with Mark Costello and I. Uh, I think it was called Seconds Out. 
and it's a girl moves into the area with a pizzeria, uh, and we both are fighting for our attention, basically, and trying to get fit and stuff. And Bobby's useless as always, and useless in love as always, but does his best to win this girl over, only to find out that Jim Watt is her father. <laughs> which we find out at the very end of the episode because we're going to fight over her and you can imagine how that pans out. So they sent a script through and true enough it was an old worn out retired boxer they'd written the part but it was myself. I had to play myself in it so I thought well surely I can manage that in my acting debut I can play myself. So I did that and you know it's one of the best uh, decisions I've ever made. It was great fun. The whole experience w w was terrific. I loved every bit of it. The, the cast were terrific. You know uh, and everything about it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now these two fighters are going to battle it out over three rounds to settle an argument to find out who gets to take out some wee lassie. Now, they're not professionals, as you'll soon realise. But I tell you, she must be some bit of stuff if these two fellas are willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for her. She's got great tits. <laughs> <laughs> and after this fight, they're going to be my tits. <laughs> now, are you boys sure you want to do this? Listen, Jim. If you'd seen this bit of gear, you'd pull the gloves on and all. Do take our word for it, Jim. There she's there. Look. Would you not walk out of broken glass for a half hour like that, eh? Stacy. Hello, Dad. <laughs> ah, Stacy. I got a fair amount of fame uh, becoming a world boxing champion in the city of Glasgow who, who loved their sporting heroes, but nothing prepared me for the fame I was going to get through appearing on Still Game. There is one thing that we should say, though, that we, we were away for seven years, and there were loads of rumours about how we'd fell out and all the rest of it, and we come back after seven years having absolutely no earthly idea whether we'd be wanted back, and the audience just completely embraced the fact that we were back and just jumped all over us. That's a fantastic feeling, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. It's great. I mean, uh, you know, seven years would have killed any other show. Still Game fans are amazing, absolutely amazing. We've got the tattoos because I, but I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of Still Game. Yeah, I did go through six hours of pain to get to get these tattoos, but it was well worth it. I mean, what better way to honour Still Game than to get Jack and Victor onto my thighs? Even still to this day, my wife doesn't even know how much I paid for them. Question one is, what is Tam's wife called? Still Game's the best Scottish comedy that's ever been created. Question two... It makes me feel pretty nostalgic thinking back to when I was younger, growing up with Still Game. Uh, most excellent show. It's just, it's, it's brilliant, it's just Glasgow humour. Just, it's absolutely brilliant, would you? What about you? Typical Scottish humour, everybody in Scotland just gets it. Yeah, no, it's, like, it's not even been on for a few years, and yet, like, any time it's on BBC One, everybody's like, right, that's what yeah. I'm watching, it's, it's hilarious. Facebook newsfeed is just full of, like, yeah, yeah. still games, game. brilliant. It's been brilliant from the journalist's point of view covering this story this year because I have had an endless succession of stories. Uh, the Still Game story has been the story that keeps on giving, but possibly one of the best nights of my, my career, uh, and certainly a night I will never forget, was uh, the night I ended up uh, gate crashing the Still Game pub quiz with the cast of Still Game. Ford Kiernan had got some t-shirts printed, Still Game. 2014, so we all put them on and headed off down Sucky Hall Street. And uh, we were quite confident as a cast we would win it. Why would you not be confident we were the cast? But we came in and uh, there was a lot of screaming and cheering and woo! And uh, murals on the wall of the cast and uh, still game fans. That's what they were, these people. Real still game fans. And we weren't long into the quiz when we realised what we were going to get a doing. It was a pretty mental night by the end of it. Uh, everyone was up dancing in the slosh, Ford Keenan was in the, the sound booth singing. It was, a, it was a mental night, one we won't forget. The fantastic thing about the way these dates were extended, you know, they were extended uh, from September into October, and then they were extended back the way, uh, you know, at the start of the run. Um, because the, the demand was so high, um, was that they knocked you two 
out of uh, playing at the Hydro, so one of the world's biggest rock bands uh, were stymied by Still Game. They were knocked out of playing this enormous venue in a big showpiece concert by two old men in their flat caps. It's fantastic. Oh, because this shower of wankers live at some bastard arena, you know? <laughs> They've not performed together for years. They've settled their differences and knew they're back. Yeah. <laughs> back to ring the last bit of sweetness suited for cold, hard cash, eh? They must think we're daft. Only a mug would pay to see a bunch of pensioners. <laughs> Staggering about the stage, you know? Monty Python. Aye. <laughs> that's, that's what we're really humbled about, the, the, the fact that the audience have been so faithful to us and continue to be. It was the biggest and greatest affirmation we could have ever hoped for. But it also told us, and we discovered about the show, that we could go seven years without having to see or speak to each other. Aye. So that's... I'll see you in seven years, you git. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Shake my home. One small step for a one-legged man. One giant leap! For Craig Lang! We're back! Yeah, so, well, there you are. Uh, uh, that flew by for me. It flew yeah. by for you. It really did. It mm. only seemed like an hour. So nothing left for us, <laughs> nothing left for us to do except to say, listen, enjoy 2015 and get one or two down your neck. Very happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Yeah. Oh, the slosh! I love the slosh. Watch my bag, Tom. <laughs> Winston? Tell me. You know a slosh man? No. But I'm very a dashing white sergeant. <laughs> mm. You're saying happy 2015. What if they repeat it next year? Oh, it's BBC, aye. Uh, oh, well, uh, a very happy 2016. Happy 2017. 2000, does this repeat money? 2018, 2019, Half 2020. 2021. Yep, 22. Mm. Mm. They have to be robots after that with their heads in a jar. Ah, right enough. <laughs> <laughs> All the best. <laughs>